Hey there, welcome to Looking Good with Google, functional design tips for teachers and sellers. My name is Shana Ramin and I am super excited to be here at the Total Teacher Summit. Thank you so much for joining me. Before we get started, just a quick little about me. Again, I'm Shana and I teach middle school language arts and journalism. I'm also a Google for Education certified trainer and just an all around technology enthusiast. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out. Here's my contact info. I'm on social media. I have a YouTube channel where I share tech tips and tutorials as well. So make sure to check that out if you find this video helpful. So. Let's go ahead and jump right in. In this session, we will cover a guide to kind of using Google fonts and just kind of some font tips in general. I also want to talk about some helpful keyboard shortcuts. I find that using keyboard shortcuts can significantly cut down on the time that I spend creating resources. And I also want to talk more about some must know tips for using Google Slides. Now I've tried to tailor this presentation towards teachers and teacher sellers. So if you are a teacher that creates resources for your classroom or a teacher that creates resources for your TPT shop, I think that these tips will be beneficial for you regardless of the category that you fall into. So hopefully you can find something useful and like I said, feel free to reach out if you have any questions after the presentation. Okay, so font tip number one. This one has to do with like finding fonts that go well together. And this actually works for any type of font, not just Google fonts, but anyway. When you are trying to find fonts that go well together in a project, this is one kind of tip that I have found really useful. You want to try and combine serif and sans serif fonts. I'll explain what those are in just a moment if you don't know. You want to try and find um, fonts that have similar properties, but that aren't too similar. If they're too similar, they're just gonna look sort of visually strange, and if they are too different, then they're also going to look kind of weird. So here's kind of what I mean by that serif and sans serif. Um, some of you may already know this if you are a font nerd like me, but serif is basically the font at the top there, sans serif at the bottom. When you first look at these fonts, you can notice a difference. And if you look closer, you can see that the difference really is that serif fonts have serifs, these little feet at the end of each letter. And a sans serif font does not have these little feet at the end of each letter. So that's kind of the, the main difference. Serif fonts seem a little bit more formal. Um, sans serif fonts are a little bit more modern and they work really well together when you pair them because of that uh, that feature, the traditional versus the modern. And just as a fun fact, sans means without in French, so sans serif means without serif. So that's one really easy way to remember it. Now, if you find two sans serif fonts that you think look good together, then by all means use that, or two serif fonts that look good together. This is not like a, you cannot ever combine two serif fonts. I just find that it really just makes it easier for me when I'm looking for fonts. If I have a title font that is a serif, I'll try and look for a normal text font that is a sans serif and vice versa. So this is a really helpful kind of guideline when you are designing. Now, I have some favorite Google font pairings as well. If you've ever looked at the fonts in Google fonts, um, you might not have found a whole lot. I have a, actually a tip for you in font tip three on how to find more. Um, but basically, these are all of, well, not all of them, but these are some of my favorite font pairings, some fonts that I think really go well together. Now, you can see up at the top with like Meriwether and Meriwether Sands. Those fonts are very similar. Um, if I were going to use this, I would probably bold the uh, serif Meriwether font just to add a little bit more contrast. But they they basically have similar properties. They're the same font family, but Meriwether Sans is obviously the sans serif version of that. Now, if you want a little bit more of a contrast, Lindrina Solid and PT Sans Narrow is a good kind of example of uh, what I meant earlier by fonts that have similar properties, but that are also very different. So Lindrina Solid is obviously a, a bolder font. So that contrast between the lighter PT Sans Narrow, that I think that works really well together. But it works really well also because of the similar properties. They're both a very narrow font and the heights of the, the font are very similar as well. So they have similar properties. They, they work really well together, but they're also very different. So that contrast actually, they, they complement each other because of the contrast as well. Now, again, you don't want something too contrasting. So that's where those similar properties come in. So feel free to take a screenshot of this or um, I'll have it as a PDF download as well. So you can just kind of download it and hopefully it will save you some time when you are searching for font pairings for your project. Okay, so font tip number two. If you have ever had the instance where you just have too many fonts that you wanna use and you find yourself using a whole bunch of fonts for a project, I have been there. Something that really helps me not do that is this tip right here, that every font in your project should serve a specific purpose. Now, here's kind of two things to keep in mind uh, with that. So you wanna avoid using more than three fonts in a project and two is usually better. If you find yourself using a whole lot of fonts for your project, this is what you wanna think about. Make sure that each font has a function or a job in that project. So 
if you can kind of assign each font a specific role, this is my header font, this is my subheader font, this is my normal text font, that should help kind of cut down on the need to use like all of the fonts. Too many fonts is just like visually overwhelming. So here's an example of what I mean by that. On one side, we have a syllabus that I uh, designed. And on the other side, we have the same syllabus, but with like a few changes that make it look not as good. Um, so here is kind of what I mean. When you first look at these, you can sort of tell, or you can probably tell which one is like the cleaner version and which one is like the overwhelming version. But just in case, a uh, little check mark and uh, X there for you. Now, the reason why the one on the left just like doesn't look as good, it's just like kind of visually cluttered, is because it has three different fonts up at the top, which is just kind of visually overwhelming. And then we have some jobless fonts at the bottom over here. So the text that says supplies and the text that's underneath units of study, those are both jobless fonts. They have no function in this project. I already have a subheading or a header two font. It's the, the, the script font, course description, um, hello middle school, units of study. So having supplies be a random font um, that's not that doesn't match the subheading font, that's jobless, it has no job. That's supposed to be the heading two font and I have it set as like some other random font. Same thing for the units of study. If you look at the normal text, it's actually century Gothic and the narrative poetry, science fiction, argument essay, that's not century Gothic. That's something random and it doesn't really fit. So it just kind of stands out and doesn't look as, as like visually cohesive. Now on the flip side, you have this one over here. Now you might have looked at that and been like, oh, that has three different fonts too, but of course syllabus is also century Gothic. So it actually matches heading one. Now in retrospect, I probably should have just had a black fill rather than trying to outline it with the white fill. But anyway, uh, you get the idea. Now, when you come over to you know the normal text, the normal text kind of matches throughout and it's just a much more like cohesive design. So that is font tip number two. Okay, so font tip number three. Now that I've just told you to avoid overusing fonts, I'm going to tell you where to find more fonts. I don't wanna add any more stress to your day, but uh, this is a really cool feature of Google Fonts that um, you might not know about. You can actually find more Google Fonts in the font library. So I'll show you where that is. Here's a quick screenshot. When you are designing in Google Slides, Google Docs, whatever, you can go into the font library and you can actually add more fonts um, to your Google library. So I'll show you where that is. You come over here this actually i will uh, talk about later in the presentation um, but i'm just going to click on my text here and then come up to where the font is and then i'm going to select more fonts so you might have seen this before um, but basically these are all of the fonts that are available and these are all of the fonts that have been added to my library and you can find this in google slides and google docs um, and google sheets so it is something that works across all google apps um, you can sort by popularity, um, by date added, by trending, and by the alphabet. I like to come in here every so often and just see like what's trending, um, what's popular, you know, what are some new fonts that I might not have seen yet. So that's kind of a, another really cool tip. If you have a love-hate relationship with Google Fonts like I do, this has helped me reconcile it a little bit. And if you want to search for any of the fonts that were on the font pairing guide, you should be able to find them if you type them into the search bar here. So that is one way to find more Google Fonts to add to your projects. Okay, so font tip number four. Let's say you have some custom fonts that you wanna use, maybe you downloaded or purchased them on Teachers Pay Teachers or Creative Market or wherever. Um, you may have noticed that you can't actually import custom fonts into Google. You're like locked into the Google Fonts and that's all you can use. I wish that were different, but that is the life we live. So one way to get around that is to allow PowerPoint to sit with us, if you will, what I mean by that is just use PowerPoint. Now I know this is all about using Google Slides, so me telling you to use PowerPoint might seem kind of weird, but there's a very easy way that you can design images in PowerPoint and then import them into Google Slides. Basically the process is to change the page dimensions in PowerPoint. So just open up PowerPoint, change the page dimensions to whatever you want the page dimensions to be. If you're making a header, you want it to be kind of like, you know, wider than taller. And if you save as, click save as, and then select PNG, that's going to save the PowerPoint file as an image. And then you can insert that image into Google Slides. So here's a couple of examples of this. The Monday font and the week of font, those are both PowerPoint images. And they were just inserted into Google Slides like as an image file. Same thing with this choice board down here, that header is a PowerPoint image. And this is um, Adventures in Digital Grading. This is from a presentation I did. This was one that I posted on Instagram and people were like, oh my God, how'd you get those fonts in there? But what I did was I just made an image in PowerPoint and then added it to Google Slides. So. Font tip number four for you. You can let PowerPoint hang out with us and uh, you can do some designing and kind of cross design and 
should be good to go. So that's font number four. Okay, so now that we've uh, kind of got the fonts down and you've got some ideas of some fonts that you can use in your upcoming projects, here are some must know tips for using Google Slides. The first one is using keyboard shortcuts. And I do want to talk a little bit about using keyboard shortcuts because I think they really help save time and work more efficiently, especially if you have a big project. Those keyboard shortcuts can really, really help cut down on some of the time that you might spend clicking. I'm also going to talk about how to change the page dimensions of Google Slides so that you can create vertical slides and some ideas of why you might want to create vertical slides. We'll talk about how to insert videos, which you might already know, but you may have not known that you can automatically start and stop videos at a specific time in the settings. Um, we'll talk about how to crop an image to a specific shape. This is also known as image masking. And we'll also talk about how we can create interactive slides using the internal linking feature. So again, hopefully there is something in here that you can uh, find useful. I think these are all just, again, must know tips for using Google Slides. Here we go, Google Slides tip number one, save time and work more efficiently with keyboard shortcuts. Here are some of my favorite general keyboard shortcuts. You can take a screenshot or again, I'll have this available as a PDF download for you. I've got the PC shortcut and the Mac equivalent shortcut here. I'm gonna demo some of these live. So, you know, paste text without source formatting, that's a really useful one. I didn't put cut, copy, and paste in here because I'm assuming we all are familiar with cut, copy, and paste, control C and all that. Um, so these are some of the like lesser known ones, but that are still kind of general, like must know keyboard shortcuts. And same thing with um, these over here. These are additional helpful shortcuts, especially when you're like working with objects in Google Slides. Now you don't have to like memorize all of these. I certainly do not have them all memorized, but I do reference them often. So here's an example. When I'm working on a project, I'll pick a couple that I think are gonna be really useful and I'll write it on a sticky note. So this is actually my sticky note for this project, for this slideshow. Control Alt G groups objects together quickly and Control Shift up or down arrow layers objects. So those are two that I really wanted to keep in mind. I used this sticky note when I was creating my interactive notebook templates uh, recently as well. So again, you don't have to memorize all of these, just pick a couple write them down and as you're working it will really help save some time so I'm going to come back over here to do some demoing so the first one is Control shift V and that is going to paste text without the original source formatting basically what that means is let's say I want to copy this text into the agenda slide so I'm going to you know copy that this is Arial 18 font and it's blue so if I come over here and I just do your basic Control V your basic paste it's going to paste it in Arial, you know, size 18 blue. I don't want that. So what I'm going to do instead is Control Shift V, and that's going to paste the text without the original source formatting. So it's going to keep the formatting of the text box that I'm pasting it into. That is probably one of the most helpful just tricks in general. It's not actually specific to Google Slides. You can do this in Google Docs as well. So that's the first shortcut, that is Control Shift V. Let's come over here to the lights. So these lights are individual objects that I've you know, added in here. Control G will duplicate that. Instead of copy and pasting, that's like you know four clicks. I can just do two clicks, Control D. And that's going to duplicate that there. And I can kind of just do one of these. So again, Control D. Okay, Control D also works if you're over here. You can Control D to duplicate a slide. So that is another one of those really helpful keyboard shortcuts that just kind of helps you save time. Anytime that you can save clicks is, is, uh, is time saved, right? So there's that. The other thing that's really cool is if you hold down the Shift key, and again, I apologize, I'm using the PC version in here, but again, the Mac equivalent is listed on the, um, on the download. If I wanna highlight all of these lights at the same time, I'm going to click on one, I'm going to hold down my Shift key, and I'm going to click on the others, and that's going to highlight all of the lights at the same time for me. Okay, so that's one thing I can do. If there are no other objects, I can also do one of these, and that's going to highlight them all at the same time as well. But holding on the shift key when you're selecting multiple objects is really useful. I could resize these all together. I could move them all together, but that shift key is uh, really helpful, and again, that is not specific to Google Slides either. The other thing that's really helpful is that layer. So when I'm working on a project, when I'm designing a resource, um, I use this one when I did my interactive notebook templates, it really, really helps save time, is Control Shift and then the up or down arrow. So Control Shift and then the up or down arrow. So you can see that right now I am layering. I'm just toggling between the up and down arrow. So if you have, let's say you copied this in and it was like down here and you're like, wait, no, I want that to be up at the front. You can right click and select, where is it? 
order, bring to front. But again, if you can avoid clicks, like avoid the clicks. So just click on the object, control shift up arrow, and that will layer it to the front, control shift down arrow, layers them on the back. So again, when you are working in um, Google Slides, that is a really helpful tool. That's one of the ones I had on my sticky note. So another one is rotating objects. Again, you can do this if you right mouse click and select rotate, but again, saving clicks, I'm going to do alt shift and then the right or left arrow, and that's going to rotate the object for me. So again, anytime I can avoid clicks, um, I think is, is helpful. So control, or I'm sorry, alt shift and then rotate. Those are some helpful keyboard shortcuts. And then the very last one, that back. And the very last one that I'm gonna demo is just the um, presenting slides. So that's control F5. And that very quickly allows me to present the slides. This helps me give like, get a, a better look at the slide. Instead of like having to zoom in, I can just kind of like do one of these and I can see what it looks like full screen. So those are a couple very useful keyboard shortcuts that hopefully you can use in your next project. So Google Slides tip number two is to change the page dimensions to create vertical slides. Now, you might be wondering why you want to create vertical slides. Um, if you're doing a vertical slide, it's probably not for a presentation or a slideshow. It might be for something like a printable worksheet, a digital notebook, or like a simulated app or something like that. Oftentimes people ask me when they see like handouts that I made, they're like, how did you make that in Google Docs or how did you make that in Word? And I either probably made it in PowerPoint or Google Slides. So I use um, Google Slides quite often just because the formatting tools are a little bit more like robust than they are in Google Docs and it's easier to format things. So I'll create just like your basic worksheets in Google Slides. I'll also, you know, I made these digital interactive notebooks, simulated apps, things like that. So to do that, all you're gonna do is go to File, Page Setup, and then select Select custom. So just to show you what that looks like in action, come over here, file, page setup, and then select custom. And then if you wanted to do like a vertical page, you do like eight and a half by 11. And then you just click apply and that would change the, the side dimensions that way. So that is how to change the side dimensions. And here are some reasons why you might want to change the side dimensions. So um, creating vertical slides can be very useful. Okay, so Google Slides tip number three is to add timers and other videos to your Google Slides and you can set these to have automatic start and stop times as well. Inserting timers is something that's really cool and really easy. I'll, I'll briefly touch on that because I get a lot of questions when I post my agenda slides that have timers on them. And then videos, you might know that you can insert videos into Google Slides, but what you may not know is you can set them to have an automatic start and stop time and that can be really useful. So here's an example, um, this on uh, screen here as a, an example of a story starter that I created for my students. I also have it available on TPT, shameless plug. Um, but basically, if you look in the corner there, you can see that there are timers that, um, there's a timer in the bottom, and I would kind of display this up there, and I would have students write for the entire like 10 minute time. I do this a lot with like free writes and things like that, because I oftentimes have students that will like give up after like three or four minutes, and I want to try and, and, and train them to uh, write a little bit longer. So I added the timer there for my students, and then I included it on the TPT resources well. Now, if you are inserting timers from YouTube, that is obviously not available for commercial use. So if you're a, t a teacher seller, you would have to either make your own timer, which is what I did here, or, you know, purchase a timer. I think there's some on Teachers Be Teachers um, that you can use as well, but that's an option uh, for you. But if you're just creating for your own students, you can insert YouTube videos and there are tons of timers. This rainbow one is actually one of my favorites. So to do that, I'm going to kind of come back over here. If you go up to insert and then you go to video, and then if you type in the YouTube search, let's say you want a 10 minute timer and you're going to get a whole bunch of 10 minute timers. So you wanna make sure, you know, some of them have music, some of them only have music at the end. One of my favorite ones is the rainbow one. It just kind of has like soft music um, at the end. So. Uh, I don't see it as a 10 minute one right now, so I'm just gonna pick the 15 minute one, but basically kind of comes in here and then you can like move it to the bottom corner or, you know, whatever. And then you've got a timer for, you know, a lot of different things. If you do bell work or anything like that, or you want students to just set timers for themselves, I use these during distance learning on free rights. I told students to start the timer on their own. I don't know if they actually did, but you get the idea. So that is how to insert videos. Um, now, something else that's really cool is when you insert videos, you can also insert videos and have them automatically start and stop at a specific time. 
So if I come back over here, I'm gonna, going to come to my next slide here. So if you inserted a video, like for one of our units, we use this clip from Stranger Things, but it's like eight minutes long and we obviously don't wanna play the whole thing. I could play the video and, you know, just kind of, you know, go like this and start it wherever I wanna start it, but that's not very efficient, right? So what I can do is actually right click and then I'm going to come over here to format options and then I'm going to click on video playback. And you can see that I have this video set to start at four minutes and 32 seconds, and it's going to end at five minutes and 14 seconds. So it's going to do all that work for me. So this is a really helpful um, resource. Again, this is more aimed towards teachers using this in their own classrooms. Um, you wouldn't be able to use this commercially in if you didn't create the video, but you get the idea. So when I click play, you can see that it automatically started right there at 4, you know, 32. It's going to start right at the time that I set. And if we let it play, it would end immediately at 514. So that is a really useful trick if you have, you know, videos that you want to show students and you don't want to have to deal with like finding the specific spot. So that is um, using videos in Google Slides. All right, Google Slides tip number four, you can crop an image to a specific shape. This is also known as image masking. Basically, I'm just going to come over here. I have this like digital paper uh, background that I made and I want to turn it into a circle. So what I'm going to do is come over here. This is like the crop image. So if I click on that, it's going to let me like crop the image this way but that still doesn't help me out as far as like getting my circle. So what I'm going to do is actually click this um, little arrow here. That's the image masking arrow. And now I can select the shape. So if I want a circle, I select a circle and now I have a circle. If I want a, an arrow, now I have an arrow. So then I can just like add a little drop shadow and whatever. So that's a really cool trick. I um, actually just recently learned this. I am surprised that I did not know this previously, but I think it's a really cool tool. And just as a side note, I really like to add drop shadows to um, things. You can also, you know, add borders and stuff like that. So anyway, this is a really cool trick and I just recently learned it. So I wanted to share that with uh, all of you as well. And lastly, we have Google Slides tip number five. And this is probably the most helpful tip that I have found for like online learning and really just like working with slides in general is to create internal slides using the internal linking feature. This has been really useful. You can see I um, have created a couple of things with this. This one right here is a choice board that I made. This is a free download. I'll link it uh, somewhere for you that you can check it out. And then over here are um, the digital interactive notebook templates that I made. Both of these make use of the internal linking feature. So let's take a look at how that works and then how to do that with our slides as well. Okay. So this is the choice board that I created. And again, this is a free download if you are um, interested in trying it out. It is already hyperlinked for you. So first we'll just kind of look at how it works. If you click on any of these links, it will take you specifically to that slide. So click on here, it's gonna take me to slide four. Now I can go home, click on this, takes me to slide five, go home, etc. When I'm in presentation mode, this is even cooler. Click on that. Take me home, click here, take me home. So you get the idea. This is um, one way to make your slides interactive. And again, this was like a game changer for me during uh, distance learning. So this is something that you could use um, to create a ton of different types of resources. If you wanna edit the text on here, just click on um, the text and then click on edit link. And then you can you know change the text with um, keeping the links intact. So um, I'll just say choice. And my caps is on, choice number one. And you can see that it still links it to the same slide. So if you change the text that way, it will keep the text intact. Um, let's say I do this and I lose the link. Basically, this is how you're going to internally link. So click on the text that you want. You're going to right mouse click and then select link. Then you're going to select slides in this presentation and then select the slide that you want to link to. This one, I wanna to go to slide A, click apply and you are good to go. I've got my internal links. So you can do this with um, pretty much anything, any purpose. And I always like to have a link at the bottom that like takes you home. So that's an example of the choice board. 
And I'm also going to just kind of briefly show you um, how you could use this to create like an interactive notebook as well. Um, these are uh, some templates that I created. I do have these on TPT, again, shameless plug. If you're a TPT seller and you've been wondering like how to create interactive notebooks, this is available for commercial use, again, shameless plug. Um, so anyway, I'm going to just kind of come into the presentation mode just so you can see how it works. Click on each of the tabs and it takes you to that particular section. So you can, again, use the vertical slide uh, trick that I shared with you earlier, and then the internal linking, and you've got a digital interactive notebook. You can see that, you know, when you're not in presentation mode, you can still toggle between the slides. So anyway, that is Google Slides tip number five. So thank you for staying with me. I hope that you learned something in this presentation, whether it was about using fonts in your projects, keyboard shortcuts to save you time, or some other must-know tips for Google Slides. If you have any questions or any other thoughts, um, comments, questions, concerns, whatever, please feel free to reach out. I am so grateful that you decided to join me today for this session. And again, please feel free to reach out on social media. I'm uh, very active on Instagram. And if you liked this video and you want more tech tips and tutorials, go ahead and check out my YouTube channel. And um, I think that's about it. Thanks for being here. And I will uh, hopefully talk to you guys soon.